Um, today, we are going to talk about the R startup. Um, they show this image uh, in the book of all the stuff that happens when you start up. But just like in the workshop, we're going to be looking like here and uh, here. Um, and actually, I'm going to talk a little bit about this because I learned that this existed because of this, some things mentioned in this chapter, and I went into it a little bit to see what's going on. Um, but so in our, so back in over here, we're going to learn about setting up environment variables in the R environment file. We're going to um, learn about the R profile file, and technically files for both of these, and like how to work with them or, you know, what, what that means, what what to put there. Um, and we're going to learn how to run R without startup files. And kind of along the way, I guess, is um, like gain an understanding of what to put in each of these files is the idea. So uh, our environment, the purpose of this is um, like, it's not our code. It's variables that you want to set um, that are more of a, like an environment, environ here means the environment that your code is running inside of, like the uh, the computer kind of, like what is it, um, what are these settings set to? So I pulled mine up and then redacted the things that are actual um, tokens. A lot of times what you'll put in your R environment would be things like, you know, this is for uh, uh, posting things on Mastodon using the R package, R toot. It's my token for that. Or posting things to LinkedIn, post or using the OpenAI API. Um, I also have like, this is a setting for some of the Slack, uh, the Slack R or, or whatever, the Slack universe that uh, Yanni CD and I have worked on for managing our 4 ds stuff. Um, I don't need to load some aspects of that. So that's what that setting's for. Uh, in R, by default, the timeout is set to it's like 60 seconds or two minutes or something like that of how long it will wait to download something. And uh, sometimes I have to download just giant files. And so I set that, I just permanently set that large. There's this not CRAN flag that is used um, for de deciding whether to test, um, like test things that are supposed to be tested when they're not on CRAN. And that was needed for one of the uh, packages that I use um, to like check how much um, test coverage I have. So things like that go in our environment. Um, I'd say the main thing that I use it for are um, you know things I don't want to type into the R console. So like passwordy things that I want it to exist, but I don't want it. I don't want to type it in. And a useful thing that you can do is. Um, I guess that you can have a project specific R environment. So you can have your personal R environment that just is like the thing that will load for you when you start R. Um, or you can have one within a project. And one thing that's important to note, if we go to uh, the thing here um, is uh, if, Let's see, it's not showing it really easily here, but if the project level R environment exists, R ignores your package or your personal general level one. Um, that's important to note. So if you think, oh, I'm just gonna set an R environment in this one project that has a different API key. Well, everything else, you know, all these other things also would not load. So it loads one file or the other file. Um, so that's useful to know. Uh, and then the example I have here is in um, my Shiny apps for R4DS. Um, I save this R environment file to set some of these, to set the key and the, that skip load thing for the app. And I save those into an R environment during deployment. And the reason I do that is um, I didn't want to check this key into the repo. And so it's stored as a secret on GitHub. So the code doesn't know what the key is, but it, it gets used when this thing is getting um, 
uploaded onto Shiny apps. Uh, and so, yeah, I guess the general thing to think about is it's stuff that you don't want to type in your console is what goes in our environment. Any questions, comments, concerns? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so all of the, <laughs> because, um, you know, when you add this um, uh, into your uh, uh, environ file, uh, usually there's a function for adding this thing. So it does automatically uh, for, for, for each one. So which one, for example, is, is the one for putting uh, the LinkedIn token? Or, oh, yeah, uh, a function. So, uh, and make sure, let me make sure that I have the, the name. So there's a use this function that will open this for editing. And I'm not going to show that on screen because, yeah, there we go. Um, because I have actual tokens in my real ones, so I don't want to um, show that on the video. But if you type that, use this edit our environment, it will load the file where you can just put wherever whatever you want into it. There isn't a specific um, function that will just add this to your edit or our environment. There are ones like I have seen that where some things um, it's possible. I can't remember for sure. It's possible that R two or R2 did that for me, that it just added it or had a function to let me add it. Um, but usually I just like manually come in here and add the things I need to add. Um, and, a lot of times like database info could also be in here. Okay, and how do you do, how do you know uh, that <laughs> this is the right thing to, to, to put yes. for, for each so, one? So uh, usually documentation will say something like, you know, the not CRAN environment variable is used by this function um, if it exists. And if it doesn't exist, it'll go, it'll do this other thing or that kind of thing. So the LinkedIn token, that was something that I like wrote something to work with the API. So mm -hmm. I knew that that's what it needed in that case. Same with the uh, open AI API key. Actually, I think there are a couple of packages that I think that's the name they are looking for for it. Um, there is the US census, so uh, for example, that's uh, loaded automatically in your okay. render on if you uh, allow. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. So there will be, I have seen that where it'll just basically, yeah. it just adds a line onto the R environment. Okay. Um, basically, they need to be capital letters. Uh, uh, there's a, I, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think they actually have to be, but that is a convention that usually the names of them are all caps. I think mostly just because within R, that's really rare to see something that's all caps like that. And so it, it helps you separate. This is um, something that's in the, the environment versus this is something that is in just the R environment, like is an object within R. Um, so yeah, these are these like, if you go to your environment tab on uh, in our studio, these don't show up. These are like separate secrets uh, that like they're in your computer's memory and they can be found with the uh, sys.getenv uh, function, but they aren't. And actually you can set them using that function as well, but it's easier to just put them all in the R environment. Um, yeah, like yeah. for this one, I'm pretty sure R2 probably told me how to get this. I don't remember exactly um, because it's a weird format for the, you know, because they have this weird user fostadon.org piece to it. Exactly. Um, even, even for Twitter, uh, for example. So sometimes they, it, if I, if you, I, di I didn't, uh, I didn't put it manually. So right. That, that's good to know that you can do it manually. But yes. now, one more question is, mm -hmm. yep. What about this project specific version? So this is means that for, for you, you might have a project and you can. Uh... So like within the folder in our studio or you know wherever you have it, you can have a separate dot r environment file, and that dot r environment only applies for that one project. And so you know you could have certain settings the reason it was useful and i didn't show this very well here because i actually ended up um changing how this works but i had in here um that it would have uh uh and actually i could probably 
do that. Um, there are, there's, um, yeah, in theory, yeah. So here it is deploying, the app name is mentor-test versus in the uh, main one, there's mentor dash. I should set that as an environment variable up here. And then just the code would be the same. Um, that's the idea is you can have a thing where in this project the app, you know, I could have the name of my app if I do this a lot and just have the R environment defines the name of the app. And that way I can use the same code. Um, and that's kind of telling uh, the system, this is where I'm working. Um, I'm trying to think, I guess I have some stuff for Tidy Tuesday, I think, for like the administration of Tidy Tuesday. I think I have some, uh, I think I have a project specific R environment, but I don't want to open any up right now and look because <laughs> they have things they tend to have things that are sensitive that I can't show on the video. Um, but yeah, that's the important note is you can have in the project it can override what you do outside of the project. All right. And then the other file that we're going to talk about is dot r profile. So this one um is R. Like it is R code and it's just R code that executes whenever you start a new session of R. Um, like I said, uh, so in the um, the other in another book club where we're reading the use this documentation, um, I talked about this that I ended up making a separate package just for myself and this, which is what I run. Like it's on top of use this, um, and then because I uh, my our profile had started to get kind of crazy. But you got to be careful with our profile because you don't want to run stuff that will change how, um, like how code behaves. It's you want to run stuff that is for it's like um, you know these are meta options. These are options for when I create a package. So sure that changes how it behaves, but unless I'm writing a package for creating packages, this doesn't impact anyone other than me basically or like the directory on my computer and which is bad I shouldn't use Dropbox but I have it I have a system down uh, that I use Dropbox and GitHub and it can cause some craziness but anyway um so yeah these are you know these options that I set that um are like visual tidy models dark things like that um I set some options like these do change how co code works but what they do is they uh give me warnings if um so by default, R does partial matching of arguments. And if you don't know that, like, I, I don't like that it does that could, because something can match the wrong thing and you didn't realize, oh, I didn't mean for it to match that. I meant it for it to match this other thing. Um, and so these throw out warnings if that happens. Um, and then I have this, so I have this setting up at the top that is basically, um, I can set this to false. And then if I'm working in a way that I don't want my weird stuff to load, none of the, my weird stuff loads. And so that really all it's doing is um, setting this to be false. Um, but so if, and actually it's, if I comment this out, uh, that's not true anymore. And therefore it defaults to false and none of this stuff will load. Uh, but the important part of that is if interactive is something you'll wanna put in your R profile a lot, because what that does is if you are working in R personally, it will load these things. So if you are in our studio or if you're, um, even if you're working at the command line in R, it loads it because that's interactive. But if you're calling a script or if you, uh, you know, if something um, you're working on packages and the testing um, system is running, the testing system is not interactive. And so it doesn't, uh, if you're running tests within our studio, that doesn't count as an interactive section. And so these things get turned off, which can be helpful to know, like how will it work for somebody else basically. So to make sure that you're not breaking anything. Um, mine, you know, it happens to be that what I do is I load dev tools, which loads, also loads uh, use this. I load rep rex and I load my personal and this package. I do it in that order because and this, I, I like override some use this functions. Um, and again, those are all just 
things that are used to make other code. They're not used inside of the code. Um, and then this last one is setting uh, my prompt in our studio has the name of the Git branch that I'm on so that I can see if I'm working where I think I'm working. And then it has the time. Uh, that way, each time something executes, you can see like how long it took without having to set a timer on everything. Um, and you know, separately, like it's probably easier on the Slack if you have specific questions of how to code different things in the R profile. But the the general idea is just making things work, like not just visually, but you know, kind of aesthetically, make things work the way you want without changing the way your your code actually executes. Now, I say that technically, if like um, everyone you work with agrees to set something in our profile, there could be cases within like a job or something where it makes sense to do some weird things in our profile. I wouldn't. I would still just put those into your code, but I could see that making sense. Um, does that at least kind of make sense? <laughs> Following along. Yeah, um, yeah. I was yep. curious how, how to uh, actually modify this thing. So you can <laughs> load this package and uh, allow, it allows for, for some options. So, and modify yeah, it. again, that is uh, edit our profile in use this is the thing to actually edit this. And then this and this package of mine, it, that's just separate. That is um, my own functions. Um, and Cause that's what was getting, I, I had defined some functions in here to like set things up for R for DS that I have, I have these functions that I wrote and I put them all over into their own package now, instead of just defining them in our profile. Um, but uh, which yeah you can do like if you want you know you can go as far as you want with your own customization um or you can like these uh lines here are pretty standard uh use this type stuff and then this without the option the um require or loading dev tools and reprex so i guess technically oops just those parts with the if interactive that's that's a thing that use this will tell you how to set up um, I think there's even a function for that, but I can't remember what it is. Um, like it might be used, yeah, it's used dev tools. <laughs> um, there's uh, use dev tools, use conflicted, use reprex, use use this, and use partial warnings. And I will uh, paste those into the chat. These are all within use this that you can just turn on. Um, the one I don't do currently is conflicted, makes you be explicit about which, like, um, for example, declaring that you're going to use filter from dplyr, not filter from, uh, is it base or stats, whatever it is. Um, and so uh, conflicted, it makes you stricter. Again, it's kind of like the use partial warnings thing, where it makes you be a little bit more strict than um, is default. And so, yeah, again, these things will set up these pieces of your R profile automatically, but you can always just edit it manually. You can do whatever you want in there. Um, setting options, setting, uh, you know, this prompt package has instructions on how to set up different, whatever you want to be in your prompt. And the idea is then in our studio, instead of just having the, um, whatever the default is, I think it's, uh, just that probably just a um, greater than symbol you can put whatever you want there and so that's what I have um, and so just to show you roughly what mine looks like so let's say I'm running use or I don't want to actually run your stuff too so I'll run you or edit our profile and I'll paste this into chat and oops yeah that. And so that's what I mean by it shows I'm on the main branch of this uh, package that I'm that I have open in our studio. And it says the time and it shows the command that I ran. And then it shows, you know, what happened after that. And then it, the new prompt is that uh, the new time. And actually, that's funny because I hadn't typed anything in a while. So that time was the last time that that prompt had been loaded. So, you know, that's 1142 was a couple hours ago. Um, anyway, so that's the idea. Any other questions on this?
I think that's, let's see. Oh, and then the last piece is um, when you run R from a command line, like in, in uh, Linux or anything like that, you can um, sending these uh, flags. So the dot vanilla flag will ignore your R profile and will ignore R environ. So you can use that to make it run um, just like, like it would run if you had never customized anything. There's also this uh, no init file uh, flag um, and no site file, which we're gonna talk a little bit more about on this next slide. Cause I was like, wait, what's a site file? Um, but with either one of those, uh, you don't, well, you don't load a version of the R profile. So the no, no site file is a different version of the R profile, but you do load the R environ. Likewise with no uh, environ that loads the R profile, but doesn't load R environ. Um, and then you can also go to the project options in our studio and tell it for this project, don't load, don't, uh, load our profile. Um, those are just some, some, you know, ways to, to test out, uh, did you break anything for anybody else? Basically, will my code, does my code still work if I don't have my stuff, my personalizations set up? Um, I think the only times that I have used these things, if at all, would be on like GitHub Actions. If I'm running some code and I want, I don't know, I could imagine there being a case where I want this piece of code to ignore uh, any environment settings, maybe. Um, yeah, any any comments on that one? I think that one basically just, it is what it is. If you need it, it's there. So, the, but the last thing, the, this, there was this thing about no site file. And I was like, wait, what is, what's a site file? What's that about? And it's like the site specific R profile. And that was from um, here. It's like, wait, what is this no site file? If it's set, it skips over this R home at R profile dot site. So what the heck is that? So I went and dug it up. Um, the idea of this one, which I could have used at my old job is this is, and our profile for everyone using this installation of R. So it's like a, an R profile for, you know, for the site, for everyone who might be there. Like we had a shared uh, server that had our studio on it. And I could have set some things that for us to use, to share together um, that probably would have been useful here. So that's what this is. It's like a higher level version of uh, our profile. So if we look at the flow chart, um, we load that and then we uh, worry about your personal R profile. So um, that is, you know, that happens before your personal R profile. And the one that, this is just a default one, I assume, because um, I've never changed it. And it has some notes, like this is exactly how it shows up is it tells you, you might want to set some things like this. Um, by default, your help type is set to HTML, but you could set it to just be text if you don't want like headers and bold and stuff. Um, you can set a CRAN mirror. Our studio automatically sets a CRAN mirror. And so I haven't played around to see how that would fight with our studio, but you could set your own in there. I mean, you can also just set it in our profile. Uh, you can have things load in interactive sessions. You know, you can do anything like you can do in a normal R profile, but the idea is that this would happen for if you have multiple users on the same machine that share an installation of R, it would happen for all of those users. That's just like, I don't think they went into this in the book other than they had they mentioned the site. And I was like, what? what's this site, R profile? So. Um, yeah, I have a question. Maybe, sure. maybe it's not, it's not, not related, uh, but the, 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 the grand mirror. So yeah. I'm, I remember that when, when I started using R, I was changing it. So setting it up uh, because there's the one in Milan, one in Padua, for example. Mm. In Italy. <laughs> but then uh, it happened like I didn't find in some packages, for example. So I put it on Australia or something. Like that. Is that what I, I didn't, I didn't, uh, you know, search too much about it. But then now I'm not using it anymore. I have installed everything and I didn't even had a so look at it. It could 
theoretically impact you. So the idea is that, you know, there's um, there are ones that are closer, physically closer to you. So technically your speed to those is going to be a little bit higher than if you're trying to hit like the R Studio one that is based in my guess would be Virginia because I'll bet the, they run it on Amazon. I don't know for sure, but if they run it on Amazon, it's probably in Virginia. Um, it's in the U.S. somewhere. And so it has to, you know, your data has to travel across the Atlantic Ocean to get to you. <laughs> for the most part, that's not, you know, like we're on a video conference. So obviously it's not that big of a deal anymore. But it is, you know, it's technically slightly better to use that distributed net network. So that would be the reason to do it. The other reason would be, so by default, like I ran this Git option repos and our studio sets your CRAN mirror to be the RStudio one. And technically the RStudio one, like it has to get its update from CRAN. And so immediately when a package is published, the RStudio mirror or any other mirror will be a little bit behind the main CRAN mirror. And so if you are trying to get something that's super up to the moment, you would want to set it to be, I don't remember what it's called, but you know, like um, CRAN, like the the root uh, uh, URL of CRAN. Um, or if you are doing something um, like I could actually see, so on um, uh, GitHub Actions, or if you have um, you know something that's running on, on Amazon, using the mirror that is closest to wherever that server is physically located that is running that thing could make that thing run, ever, you know, milliseconds faster. And if that matters, then that would be a reason to do it. That you want to get the um, the faster download time. Now, you know, most of the time, if you're running a server where to speed matters, don't be hitting CRAN, <laughs> like have it already locally installed. But um, they are exactly the same yeah. in location. So they mirror yeah. each, uh, each other. So they, they're exactly the same. So I thought there was, there was some, uh, there was, there were some differences. There, I mean, so, you know, the different mirrors are, you know, the, um, the hardware they're running on are located in different places. And so that can make it slightly faster. That's all. That's the only reason anything like that matters. And 15, 20 years ago, it mattered a lot more than it matters now um, because speeds have gotten so high that the, I don't know. I don't know if, how much, how often you notice a difference of if you're hitting a site in Italy versus a site in the United States. Um, it's hard to tell because so many sites are physically located uh, you know, on the Amazon servers in, I mean, they have their distributed around the world too, but a lot of them are just on the servers that are in the U S. So even if you're hitting an Italian site, you might be hitting the U S. Uh, but yeah, that's all that's for is, uh, if it matters, you can hit a, a local one or sorry. The other reason this matters is, uh, a business could have their own CRAN that is like a subset of CRAN. Um, or that updates only at certain, you know, once a quarter or whatever. And so in that case, you it's like your approved version of CRAN might be what you want to hit. Um, I never had that situation where my business like restricted what packages I could install, but that would be especially why you would want to do that in this R profile that site is you're saying all of my users of R should get the our local version of CRAN. And so that's why they specifically call it out as my local CRAN, because who knows, it could be, you know, your university or your uh, business or whatever. Um, again, it's never been something that I've needed. Uh, I'm fine going with the default or the one that our studio sets, but um, whatever. It is, so I have seen that though, where uh, the R Studio one won't have an update yet that the root, uh, you know, actual CRAN has and so that would be the case where you want to change the mirror to be the one the the, the real one like the uh not mirror i guess is what it is at that point it's the actual object not the reflection of it um yeah 
so yeah, that's that's it. Uh, you know, I, I actually ended up going into a little bit more than what's in the book because there isn't that much in the book. Um, but yeah, they talked about the disabling. Oh, and actually, I will point out that this thing that they say here, um, there it you have to have an empty line at the end of your R profile and your R environment or R can, and I think it depends on exactly where you load it, but it can just ignore the last line, which can be a really hard thing to debug if you don't know, like if you don't know about that, it's like, wait, no, this thing is set. I can see that it's set. Why isn't it loading? Well, because it's not actually set at that point. And within our studio, the, um, Let's see, do I have it handy? Uh, that's not open right now. Um, there's a setting, oh, I'll just find it. Um, I guess that did load. So um, yeah, use, use in line. So in, co in the code section of the RStudio global options on saving, ensure that source files end with a new line. I highly recommend checking that box and actually um, at least those first two boxes. I'm a big fan of those because they just like clean up these things that are invisible to humans, but computers care about them. And so uh, I really recommend those two settings. And that way you don't have these weird errors that you don't notice. Um, so yeah, and that's it. That's the chapter. Um, Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. So, yep, I, I will uh, see you next week.